There we are. All right, folks, uh, welcome to live uh, Ideas on the Verge today. I'm really excited to be interviewing uh, Dmitry Olov. And um, just before we get started here, I just wanted to say hello to everybody. And I was hoping someone out in the interwebs could give me a sound check. Uh, so, folks, uh, welcome to. And Dimitri or Sarah, if you guys have your YouTube video playing sound, just make sure you turn that off there so we don't get any feedback. Your love. And um, just before we get started here, I just wanted to say hello to everybody. And I was hoping someone out in the interwebs could give me a sound check. Uh, so, folks, uh, welcome to. And Dimitri or Sarah, if you guys have your YouTube video playing sound, just make sure you turn that off there so we don't get any feedback. And um, just before we get started here, I just wanted to say hello to everybody. All right, so I think okay, the uh, I think the audio replay there is uh, has caught up now finally on our end here. So I think we've got that going. So if you're just hearing this right now, just let me know um, if uh, the sound is coming through clearly on your end. And uh, we'll do our sound check. And uh, if you're just signing in right now, let us know who you are, where you're coming from. And um, yeah, I would just love to hear about what you're potentially interested in hearing about today uh, on this show with Dimitri. I'd also be curious, while we're just getting ready to, to get uh, started here in about five minutes, how many of you guys have actually read uh, Dimitri's book? Um, we're going to be talking today about the five stages of collapse, which is not his newest book, but uh, probably one of his most well-known books. And um, I definitely understand why now after uh, delving into it on my own. So just uh, introduce yourself in the chat. You can uh, put something up there and introduce who you are, where you're calling from, and uh, one thing you hope to get out of today's interview. Um, and then the last question was, uh, how many of you have actually watched, uh, or sorry, uh, read this book or read a blog about the book? Be very curious to, uh, um, to hear your thoughts on it. We're gonna be getting started here in about four minutes. And i uh, really excited about this interview. I've been reading Dimitri's book over the last, actually, four weeks. Um, I took a vacation in October and uh, started uh, diving into it. And it's, it's really dense uh, in a good way. Um, and what's really great about um, this book or what I found when I was reading it was the, uh, the comedy that he kind of splices into these really hard hard to uh, think about topics. Um, as you can imagine, collapse is not the easiest of topics to, to discuss, but Dimitri does a really great job of, of um, balancing that. So again, let's uh, get you guys to introduce yourself in the chat window and let us know where you're calling in from. And we're gonna get started here in about three minutes. So I'm just going to... Uh, And just um, just a quick favor to ask, folks, if um, if you have signed in, um, please share this on your social media channels, uh, either Facebook or Twitter. It helps the channel to track. And I think that this interview is uh, one of those interviews that you're definitely going to want to to share with your friends. It's um, Dimitri and I had a conversation prior to this uh, this um, conversation that we're having today. And uh, I think it's going to be a pretty hard hitting um, and super interesting conversation um, that no one's going to want to miss. This of course does get saved to YouTube. And so you can watch it after the fact, uh, if you don't get a chance to watch it live. Um, so you can always share it after as well, but um, um, yeah, it's going to be a, a pretty interesting conversation. So guys, if you're just signing in, just uh, let us know where you're coming in from. One thing you hope to get from, the interview today, we're interviewing Dmitry Orlov, who wrote The Five Stages of Collapse. Um, and I'd be curious, out, uh, with regards to who out there has already read the book or has read a review about the book. Okay, well, let's get, uh, let's get this thing kicked off. So welcome to Ideas on the Verge. Uh, it's a collaboration between Verge Permaculture and New Society Publishers. Last year, Michelle and I and myself wrote a book on rainwater harvesting, and throughout that process, we got to know New Society. We like them and their books so much that we decided that we'd like to work together a little bit more. And so we came up with this idea about a monthly or bi-monthly um, book club of sorts, where we would go out and ask super hard questions of 
authors from New Society that had similar topics or topics that were adjacent to uh, permaculture um, that would benefit our network um, in terms of the information that these authors have so generously shared through their books. So each session will be uh, interviewing an author and then towards the end of the conversation, um, we'll be giving a book away to one lucky person in the chat window. So if you're leaving uh, lots of comments in the chat window, uh, definitely it's gonna improve your chances of winning this book. Um, and then if you're on the Ideas on the Verge newsletter, and there's a, a link to the show notes below, um, that's a se separate segmented newsletter list that we have that um, will provide you with reminders with regards to when we go live, before we go live, of course. And then after the interview is done, um, you end up with a uh, coupon code for 48 hours if you choose to purchase the book. So if you buy the book within 48 hours after this interview, we will provide you with a 25% discount code on the book itself. And so you get notified about that once you're on that list. So if you're not on the list, you can go ahead and subscribe down below. Um, and then lastly, we've interviewed um, Colleen and Eric Rapp from um, Raising Meat Rabbits. That was last week. And then prior to that, we did an interview with Chris Magwood on sustainable building design. And so if you haven't watched that, you might want to go back into some of the previous shows. All these videos are going to be saved on a playlist within our Verge Permaculture YouTube channel. Um, and you can go and watch those. And those are super also very dense interviews with uh, subject uh, experts within their field, in that case, rabbits and sustainable building design. So go and check that out as well. Um, so with me today, I've got Sarah, who's the marketing manager for New Society Publishers. Sarah, I'll let you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the collaboration. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Rob. I'm really excited to be here again and welcome to Dimitri. Um, for those of you who don't know, New Society is an activist, solutions-oriented publisher. We pride ourselves on walking our talk and having the highest environmental and social standards of any publisher in North America. This includes printing on 100% post-consumer recycled paper, printing in North America only, never, we never print overseas. We've also been a carbon neutral company since 2006 and our employees are shareholders in the company. And we're also a certified B Corporation. So it's really important for us that we, um, we're people, planet, profit. So we um, have a triple bottom line there. Um, so we're thrilled to be able to collaborate with Verge Permaculture on this project. I think with the sharing of ideas and information on as many platforms as possible is key to creating community and real change in the world. I wanna give a shout out to all of our authors um, for their willingness to share their often hard won knowledge and expertise with our readers. It really can be comforting um, when you're embarking on a new project or contemplating new and challenging ideas to know that someone's been through it before you and can help to walk you through it um, and helping you to miss the many potholes that may reveal themselves along the way. So just really thank you, Dimitri, for being with us here today. And I'm just really looking forward to being a part of the show. Fantastic. So I'm just going to introduce, introduce Dimitri. Um, I'm actually just going to read the bio off of his book here. And then I wanted to give the, the blurb on the back of the book too, because I think it does a really great job of uh, giving you guys a sense of what we're about to get into in this interview. Um, if you've never heard of Dmitry Orlov, um, there are several blogs out there that have done a really great job of capturing kind of the high points. But um, my gosh, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a very dense read. And um, it's the nuances that Dmitry gets out of this book that I think um, really... Um, were really important to me because I've read, I've read a bunch of blogs about this book. And so getting into those nuances is really important. And we're going to touch on some of those nuances tonight, as well as kind of what's top of mind uh, for Dimitri. So um, just uh, get to his bio here. So Dimitri Orlov has written extensively on the subject of collapse, being first, uh, being first to compare the collapse of the USSR to the projected collapse of the the uh, world's other Cold War superpower, the United States. He is the author of numerous, numerous articles in the award-winning book, Reinventing Collapse, The Soviet Example and American Prospects. Born in Russia, he moved to the US while a teenager and has traveled back repeatedly to observe the Soviet collapse during the late 80s and mid 90s. He's an engineer who has worked in many fields, including high energy physics research, e-commerce and internet security. 
And for the past five years, he has been experimenting with off-grid living and renewable energy by giving up the house and the car. And I believe he's in Russia right now. Um, so he can talk a little bit about his most recent uh, uh, situation. Um, instead, he has been living on a, a sailboat. So this was previous to this, sailing it up and down the Eastern seaboard and uh, commuting by bicycle. Dimitri believes that given appropriate technology, we can greatly reduce the personal resource consumption while remaining perfectly civilized. And then just while I've um, got your attention there on that, um, on the back of the book, when thinking about the political paralysis, looming uh, resource shortages and rapidly changing climate, many of us can do no better than to imagine a future that is just less of the same. But it is during such periods of profound disruption that sweeping cultural chains becomes inevitable. In the five stages of collapse, Dmitry Orlov posits that a taxon taxonomy of collapse suggesting that if the first three stages, financial, commercial, and political, are met with the appropriate personal and social transformations, then the worst consequences of social and cultural collapse can be avoided. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, the description goes a little bit longer, but I think that does a really good job of kind of summarizing uh, what we're what we're going to be talking about. So, um, so I have to just state something before I bring Dimitri on here. Um, I've actually only made it about halfway through this book because of its density, and I'm definitely going to finish it. Um, and the reason I kind of stopped there was because I think that Dimitri and I probably could have three or four conversations about this book alone, which we may end up doing. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about that just before the show um, to kind of really get into some of the other kind of meaty parts of, of this book. And so today I want to talk mostly about the first half of the book. Um, and um, and then and finish it off with with a really interesting twist uh, towards the end there. So my first sign that I was going to enjoy this book uh, when I got it uh, sent to me uh, was the front cover. And um, for those of you who know a little bit about who I am and and uh, some of the uh, philosophies that I uh, believe or or prescribe to, um, you know that I'm a big fan of Nassim Taleb. And so. Um, looking at the front cover of this book, um, there's a little black swan swimming right here. Um, and uh, Nassim Taleb wrote a book called uh, The Black Swan, which uh, basically talks about how most consequential change occurs as a result of massive, unpredictable events, um, which he refers to as black swans. And the premise behind The Black Swan is really that um, prior to uh, Westerners going to Australia, they had no idea that uh, there were any swans in the world that were black. And so ornithologists basically thought that all swans were white. And they did that through a process of deductive reasoning, which um, we can tend to um, be subject to in our own um, lives. And one might go to a place like Costco, as an example, and see all the shiny food and packages and uh, people that are probably a little bit obese um, and get the sense through deductive reasoning that everything is fine. Um, when just underneath the surface, people like Dimitri have done the hard yards to really figure out um, what is actually going wrong with the world and where those fragilities might exist and what the consequences of those fragilities might actually be. And that's really the heart of what Dimitri's trying to get across, I think. And he might correct me um, early on in the conversation that's happened before. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's bring Dimitri on and, um, Dimitri, you know, at the beginning of your book, you talk a lot about, um, um, actually before I get to that question, I want to ask like, what was the, what was the thing? What was the, the straw that broke the camel's back that got you interested in this? Was it, was it the culture that you grew up in and, and observing that from a young age? Like, what was it that got you super interested in studying collapse and, and making a career out of it? Well, what, what triggered the whole thing was uh, going back to Russia uh, in 1989 and then 1990 and uh, a few years later and then a few years more uh, went by and I went back. And so I was watching the entire collapse sequence unfold. In 89, I went back to the Soviet Union and it was very recognizable as the place where I grew up. In 1990, it was uh, already quite different. And then in, in subsequent, during subsequent visits, I was just absolutely shocked to discover that the place was changing before my eyes. Um, and the transformation was in, incredibly profound. Um, now, nobody predicted this. Um, all of the uh, 
Sovietologists and criminolo Kremlinologists that uh, stalk the holes of Congress and, and the CIA uh, ended up with egg on their faces because they did not predict any of this. Plus they were out of a job because the thing that they had studied uh, no longer existed. And then the events that unfolded afterwards uh, really made me question what was holding the United States together because you know, what's, what's so different? One superpower, another superpower. There were a lot of symmetries. And so reasoning by symmetry, I started thinking about, well, how far behind in the collapse curve is the United States? Because the trajectory is probably the same. That's when I started studying the energy issues. Um, and uh, it turned out that, you know, there was a lot of symmetry between the, the US and the USSR in terms of energy, except the balance was in the opposite direction. It has shifted back and forth a few times, but it is definitively in Russia's favor at this point. But that was one of the things I was tracking and various other things as well. And um, then at some point I just decided to write an article uh, and uh, Mike Rupert published it and everybody read it and everybody seemed to like it. A lot of people seemed to like it. So that sort of launched a, uh, a mini career, if you will, in, into the study of collapse, which I'm keeping up with to this very day. Right, very interesting. So in the beginning of your book, um, I, I found it really interesting that, uh, and I'm kind of reading between the lines here, so I could be totally wrong on this, but, um, and, and let me just give a bit of context to this question here. So I, I remember in the early days when I started learning about peak oil, I'm, I'm originally a petroleum engineer, um, and spent a significant amount of time designing pipelines and oil and gas facilities. And, and one day I, I learned about peak oil and, and it kind of switched something in my head. Um, and it's, it was not necessarily very pleasant for the people around me um, to have to listen to me uh, draw, draw on about peak oil over and over and over again. Um, and, and in some sense, actually, I think people kind of saw me as chicken little um, but it didn't take long for me to learn that I had to be careful about what I said to, to certain people. And based on the beginning of your book, you kind of hint at uh, that fact. Is that something that like talking about this is, is really difficult? How have you managed that in your life without kind of driving the people uh, you know, around you away from you? Well, very, very early on while delving into the subject, um, I, I think the first time I brought it up while we were you know, sitting, sitting around, uh, uh, you know, a table at a bar, uh, and I tried to broach the subject. I, um, I realized that this was probably not such a great idea to sort of go, go, you know, everything you know is kind of wrong, and here's how it really is, and this is what's really going to happen. It's just really going to be dreadful. So let me, let me uh, flush this out for you. That's just a really stupid approach, and. Um, it made me think of a, a phrase that's used a lot by CIA um, operatives. And it's, it's the, the phrase is need to know basis. Basically, you tell people something if they need to know it and you don't tell it to them if they don't need to know it. The only reason somebody needs to know something is if they can act on it. If they're not likely to be able to or want to act on it, you have no business telling them that. And so that's basically in my modus operandi since then. Uh, I tell people who uh, want to talk to me on the subject, whatever it is that they ask me to tell them. Uh, I publish things um, and whoever wants to can read it. Um, and that's about, that's about it. That's about the end of it. Now, I'm not about to impose my opinions on anyone. In fact, I'm, I'm very clear that I want other people to make up their own minds and don't blame me if I turn out to be wrong. Yeah, I think approaching this with a, a probabilistic um, approach is really smart uh, because, uh, you know, there's an infinite number of potential outcomes, um, but uh, there's really, well, I should say infinite number of potential outcomes, but there's really ultimately only one outcome that will occur, essentially. So I think approaching it that way is, is really good. Tell me a little bit more about, uh, you know, what you did prior to um, writing about collapse. Um, tell me a little bit about your engineering career and how that has helped you to um, ferret out the details um, you know, within this space. Well, I, I, um, 
I finished high school in, in the US at a time when all of my friends' parents were losing their jobs. It was 1981, it was the recession. And uh, uh, that sort of uh, informed my generation that trying to kind of like connect, hook into the American dream was a, a stupid idea. All of us being from Russia, all of my friends were, were basically Russians that, you know, whose families tried to make a go of living in the US discovering that you're basically a throwaway commodity. Um, a lot of my friends decided to then hitchhike to Alaska and uh, ended up just basically hunting and fishing and, and growing weed and, and whatever it is to, there is to do in Alaska and never got an education. I went into engineering because, the, because I got a, you know, a stipend, you know, free tuition plus a stipend uh, to do that. So that's what I did. And I ended up studying computer engineering. And before I finished that, I got a job in high energy physics, designing uh, various types of instrumentation, data acquisition, electronics for high energy physics experiments at various places like Fermi Lab and, and CERN. And so I did that for six years. And um, uh, then, then of course, um, the Soviet Union fell apart and the US no longer had any reason to compete in science. So they, they basically canceled all these science projects, including the one I was working on at the time called the Superconducting Super Collider. And all of these physicists in the US lost their jobs just because the USSR collapsed. And um, so I, I quit and went into linguistics instead. And again, got full scholarship to study various languages and ended up pursuing that career for a while, but decided it didn't pay enough. So I went into the internet, which was started booming at the time and uh, followed that for about six years, six, seven years, uh, did all sorts of things uh, related to software engineering and internet security and, and things like that. And, um, then I just sort of gave up on all of that, gave up on all of the corporate stuff because I was sick and tired of it. Uh, my wife and I bought a sailboat and moved aboard and sailed off and uh, did that for another five or six years. And uh, uh, along the way, our son was born and then we decided to move back to Russia because bringing up children in the US seemed a little dicey. Whereas bringing up children in Russia has worked out really well for our families for many, many generations. So we're back here now and enjoying ourselves. Really cool. That's amazing. So I'm, I'm curious, do you still sail? Are you still involved in sailing? Well, it's a very seasonal pursuit here in Russia. Right. Um, I might take it up at some point, but I, I like tropical waters more than I like frigid northern waters. Right. Cool. All right. Um, so the next kind of part of the interview, uh, Dimitri and I had a conversation yesterday and we we're kind of talking about some of the stuff that is top of his mind right now. And, um, and this really is captured in the first uh, part of the book, um, this idea of cultural collapse. So um, what was really great about this part of the book uh, for me was that I've been contemplating a lot of the stuff that uh, Dimitri has been talking about um, what is talking about in this book in, in extensive detail. Um, and just to kind of give a bit of context for uh, North Americans right now, in, in Ontario, now we have this populist politician who's getting rid of inexpensive daycare and everybody's up in arms about it and, and talking about how it's going to create variations of cultural collapse. And I find this argument really interesting because on one hand, I can, I can see how for the working class, having inexpensive daycare um, can mean the difference between actually putting food on your table and, and, uh, and being able to have a family at the same time and not. Um, however, getting up in arms about inexpensive daycare also kind of misses the point. Um, and it's a point that I think Dimitri does a really great job talking about in his book, um, which is, it's almost like this, this thing is a bit of a double fake in a sense, because it doesn't really address the root cause of the issue, which is that in our Western um, entrepreneurial and capitalist based system, um, the real issue, a lot of our decisions are made based on uh, uh, financial uh, instruments, taxes, things like that, um, incentivization. Um, and, and really with the way that our tax systems and, and how we've set up our incentives in this market based economy, um, 
it's not really feasible for single income families or multi-generational um, uh, families to coexist essentially. And, and actually just to give a bit of background on that, I actually co-house with my mother-in-law and it's made the biggest difference for us. I mean, having a third adult to help raise kids um, allows my wife to go on dates. It allows us to take risk in our business. I mean, we could talk, we could have a whole episode about the benefits of multi-generational living. Um, do you want to speak a little bit to that, um, Dimitri? Well, yes, there's been a concerted effort to destroy the family. Uh, part of it was uh, kind of taking the families apart into in sorting them out into generations uh, and disconnecting them from each other in as many ways as possible, uh, removing all the incentives for families to live together as multi-generational units, um, uh, making women work uh, and paying their husbands half as much was something that has happened um, in the wake of World War II. Uh, most, most people greeted that as a, you know, as a liberating thing for women. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's really interesting to note that, you know, Russian women have a, a rather dim view of that because they went through the same process, except they went through it maybe 40 years earlier. Uh, they were liberated pretty early on and then realized that now they have to both do all of their family work and also do all of their uh, official work outside the home. So how is that a victory? Um, so now Russian women are uh, rather eager to be in a position to be able to stay at home and few of them are able to. But in general, uh, the, 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 the bigger the, the family unit you have, the, the, uh, the more diffuse are the responsibilities and, and uh, the more prepared you are to deal with any eventuality. Um, if, you, if it's down to just two people and one of them gets sick, the entire scheme falls apart. Um, no, that's some, that definitely something to avoid. Part of our decision to move back to Russia was the fact that we have lots of family here, lots and lots of family here. And it just, that just manifests itself in so many ways. It just makes life so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I thought that, I mean, this is one of the first things that kind of got me interested in your work a long time ago. There was a blog that, that you wrote that captured some of this uh, stuff about cultural collapse and, and uh, really got me thinking. And I've, I've quoted that blog several times and in the past. We um, teach permaculture design courses. And I think that some of the lessons that are written in this book, which is really where this blog came from, um, are super important for people to understand. So the the blog, if I remember correctly, juxtaposes um, the and, and the book juxtaposes the former Soviet Union relative to the United States. And you've already mentioned that so far. Um, but what I thought was really brilliant was how you um, compared what a collapse would look like or what a collapse did look like in the USSR versus um, the U.S. when it comes to all of the different uh, facets of society. So um, the food system, the housing system, the energy system, um, the financial system, and even like basic general goods. Um, I, I'd love for you to, to paint that picture uh, live on this interview and, and how those two, how a market-based economy like the United States, even Canada, um, would fare when compared to... Um, the USSR. And, and um, just before you get into that, you know, it'd be really great for, um, for people to understand how that relates back to anti-fragility. So like almost like the, the upside of down um, that, uh, that you saw as a result of, of, of people coming out of a, you know, the USSR basically, and, and how that the, um, the downside that they had to live with for so many years, how that contributed to the resilience that we ended up seeing uh, amongst those people. Well, yes, the second big thing that I unleashed on the world after this first article that I wrote for Mike Rupert, uh, which was, was called Post-Soviet Lessons for a Post-American Century, um, it's, it's still out on the internet and um, it's, it's still quite relevant, I think. But the second thing I unleashed was the slideshow called Closing the Collapse Gap, it was from a talk that I presented in Manhattan at a, an en energy conference. And that was incredibly well received. And there I basically outlined how uh, the Soviet Union inadvertently prepared its population to survive collapse. I missed a couple of things, but uh, as far as the, uh, 
the economic and the social organization, I think I nailed it. I think it's still relevant. So for instance, uh, in, in, in the US, if, if you lose your income, you don't have a place to live because you have either a mortgage or you have to pay rent. So you, without an income, you're automatically home, homeless. Um, whereas in Russia, nobody really, uh, nobody owned the place where they lived. They, they just were issued an apartment by the government, which is where they lived. Nobody took, took it away from them. The utilities somehow were, you know, the lights stayed on even if nobody could pay their bills. And the heating system in, in most major Russian cities, uh, the heating was provided by waste heat from, uh, from uh, power plants. There, there weren't any furnaces in the basements. It was steam pipe, buried steam pipe uh, under high pressure circulating hot water through uh, all of the buildings through, through radiators. So nobody froze. Then in, in the US, if, if you lose your ability to drive your, your private car, then you're pretty much stranded. Whereas there were very few cars in Russia uh, privately owned, uh, but there was plenty of public transportation, which uh, kept running throughout the, 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 un, the, the collapse period. Um, it's running to this day. So people were not stranded, they were mobile. And, and there were a lot of other things like that, uh, that uh, allowed people to make a tra transition. One of the things that I noted in particular was the entire kitchen garden economy. Um, the kitchen gardens were uh, something that is tradi was traditionally part of the Russian culture. And uh, they, they uh, played a very fundamental role in terms of letting people survive during the worst times. During the time of war, people were just basically issued land on which to grow potatoes. And so most of them did. My family had a potato field and you could tell how, how well or badly the economy was doing by the boundary line between the strawberries and the potatoes. <laughs> if the times were good, you had a lot of strawberries and just a little bit of potatoes because why grow potatoes when you can buy them? Um, whereas when the times were bad, the strawberries were pretty well gone and the entire field was potatoes. Uh, enough potatoes to feed the family. Um, that, so that, that was uh, something that allowed people to survive. In terms of what I missed uh, about the, the differences and the similarities between the USSR and the USA is just how resilient Russian culture turned out to be. And that was a surprise because the Soviet Union fell apart in 1990 pretty much. And then in the year 2000, it took off like a rocket and turned out that the Russian culture just through the sheer bloody mindedness of the people had stayed in, intact and in spite of the horrible times that, that passed in the meantime. And so as a result of that, Russia is doing rather well now. One of the things that's, that still sticks in my mind this day is how you, I think you made a comment about how, uh, because it was state provided um, housing, that if you didn't like your neighbor, you had to sort it out. <laughs> and living in a Western city, um, we seem to have an inability to have a, a regular conversation with our neighbor if something's wrong. And instead, we hire uh, bylaw officers to come and regulate these um, crazy bylaws, um, as opposed to just being able to have a mature conversation with with our neighbors. And it seems that that communication, and, and you might you might be able to talk a little bit about the the newest book that you just wrote here. But it seems as though that if we're not speaking in 143 characters or whatever Twitter is, I don't I don't subscribe to Twitter, but um, small sound bites. Um, um, you know, we, we can't even have a conversation anymore. And it's, it strikes me that because of the, the permanence of being forced to live next to somebody, you know, and I, I'm probably misrepresenting it because I've never lived in Russia, but I, I, can you talk a little bit about how that, um, that system forced people to communicate? Well, in, in Russia, if you didn't like your neighbor, that was too bad because the, the people who weren't your neighbors would like you even less. As a kid growing up in Russia, I knew that if I walked into uh, the wrong neighborhood unaccompanied, there'd be a lot of questions. Uh, you, you really had to have strength in numbers. You had to organize with people directly around you. And it was really by building and by, by neighborhood that, that people organized. And 
you know, basically for self-defense. Uh, here, you know, in, in the States, in Canada, there's the police to protect you. Uh, and the police is supposed to protect the innocent and I guess punish the guilty or something along those lines. Uh, in Russia, it was pretty basic. If, if people made trouble, they were punished. It doesn't matter who was guilty, who was innocent. It's like if two people have a fight, it doesn't matter who started it, they both get punished. Um, so people avoided the officials. They tried to sort things out by themselves. Somebody who attracted public attention was basically seen as an incompetent and a menace. So it was a very different mindset. In terms of people talking in the US, Surprisingly, I have found a lot of people quite easy to talk to, um, and and uh, it's it's not that people don't want to talk; it's that they insist on on maintaining some sort of a, a front before other people. They they have their holy cows, their shibboleths, their 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 red lines that they don't want other people to cross. And um, I discovered that all of that is just complete nonsense when I moved from from uh, Boston, which in the South is called Yankee land uh, to the South, to South Carolina. And I didn't really have any issues with talking to anyone, but all of the people that were there from the North with me did. And that was a very interesting thing to discover. Um, I didn't think that the reasons that they had so much trouble talking to each other were meaningful in any sense. Hmm, interesting. So in one of your last comments, you talked a little bit about how resilient the Russian culture ended up being. Would you say that the, the, the comfort that we have in, in the Western world and the um, homo, I can't say this word, homo uh basically the homogenous, the homogenous uh, conditions that we have in our country um, almost atrophies community? Uh, it seems like everything in our culture, I mean, we live in 21 degrees Celsius all the time. Um, you know, we have a lot of comfort in, in this uh, very rich society that we live in. And is that, is the lack of that, which was for sure really difficult to live with. It was not a, um, probably a pleasant um, existence uh, during the time, but would you say it's, it was, it was those, those difficulties that the Russians endured that created that uh, resilient culture that you guys are benefiting from right now? Well, um, Russia has a, a history that is still very much raw uh, and in, in the public memory, in the public domain. Um, it, it, everything, is, everything revolves around the dead. The dead are very much with us. There's a Russian saying that the dead are our sentinels. The dead will come to our defense. Um, that's, it, it may seem like a, a very macabre way to look at history, but uh, Russia has survived through death um, and destruction, waves of it. And, and so that, that is a, a very important part of the Russian mindset. Uh, compare that to the United States and Canada, which have never been invaded. They have never been bombed to oblivion. Toronto has never been razed to the ground or Montreal um, or any of the other major cities, but that's been part of the Russian experience. You know, I don't know what would happen to Americans if New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston were just completely taken out. It would probably just blow people's minds because they have no idea what it's like. I don't know what Americans' response would be to, an, to living under an occupying army uh, where they're say forbidden to speak English in public. Um, that, that's been part of the Russian experience. Um, and, and I can tell you how the Russians respond to their major cities being destroyed. They get really mad. That's all that happens. And then they go on to win and they've done it repeatedly. Um, and so that, that is kind of like, that, that creates a certain type of character that is very tough for people who have lived in a very secure environment where, we're, where you know, there were maybe some locals that they once fought, but they were always the top dog. Um, they could always go on an extermination mission against some unruly native here or there or anywhere and, and never pay for it. You know, the, the Russian experience is just dramatically different. And, and so the character that that created is, is just very, very different. Mm. Yeah, super interesting. 
So uh, to round this conversation out uh, into solutions, let's talk a little bit about um, the third part here, which we were discussing yesterday, and, and that is taking responsibility. Um, again, if, if you've been on my channel for a while, you guys know that uh, we teach permaculture design courses, which is very much a solutions design approach to sustainable human habitat. And I think a lot of the, the comfort that we um, enjoy in the Western world uh, is a result of, of massive centralized systems that commodify things like heat and food, um, even shelter, um, which is where I think a lot of the, the atrophy occurs within our uh, society. So we don't know how to grow food anymore. We don't know how to build shelter anymore. Um, we don't know where our energy comes from or even how to heat our houses. I mean, it's almost illegal to have a wood stove in parts of, of North America now. Um, and so one of the things that we're really big on in permaculture is taking responsibility for our own actions. In fact, there's a, um, a statement within uh, Bill's design manual, which is take responsibility for your home and garden so that it shelters and feed you, feeds you. And in the event of, um, you know, a massive disruption of food, water, energy, even the waste system, um, I don't know how many North American homes would actually um, survive something like that, because I don't think that the way that we're currently designing or building houses or even the food system um, really has that in mind. And so, can you talk a little bit about how, um, how how individuals that understand these concepts, or at least are beginning to understand these concepts, how taking responsibility is is the medicine that kind of um, will allow things to continue um, even in the event of of disruption? Sure. Well, um, one of the problems with uh, talking about responsibility is that um, it's basically a euphemism for guilt trip in a lot of ways. It's a, a way for people who actually don't do much that's useful to, to create guilt trips in the minds of other people and make them respond to various stimuli, uh, be it, uh, you know, uh, send money to causes that then waste it and squander it in various ways. Uh, famine relief organizations are particularly notorious in that way. Various other types of humanitarian missions where you know, those, those in charge get to uh, jet and limo around and waste most of the money and then a little bit of the money filters through to the people it's supposed to. That's all based on guilt trips. Then of course you have uh, various other initiatives having to do with alternative energy and, and global warming, et cetera, where you're, you're told to, be, to take responsibility for something uh, that, first of all, you don't know how to do. You don't know how to solve the problem. So you can't possibly be made responsible for it. You're not qualified. And secondly, it's beyond your control. So why would you expect to uh, be held responsible for something that is beyond your control? Uh, and those are really the three the, the, there are three ingredients to, to being responsible, to either being made to accept responsibility or being uh, made answerable. Um, and that is being qualified. So if you, if, you, if, you have, if you want to claim a right to do something, then you have to have the privilege of doing it. So a driver's license is the privilege to drive. There, there are licenses for most things that require especially responsible behavior, be it brain surgery or, or aircraft maintenance. You, you can't just walk in and do it. You have to be qualified. So th to have the right to do something, to have the right to accept responsibility, you, you have to be granted that right by others. You have to rise to that level. Um, and then you have to be in control. So uh, if, you, if, a, if a bus crashes, but you weren't driving it, then you're not responsible. Um, it's, you know, that is as simple as that. But if we look at things like global warming, for instance, or overpopulation is another big one. A lot of people are being made responsible for things like that. So you buy a smaller car because of global warming, something like that, or you, um, or the plastics plague. The idea is that if you use a, a reusable plastic bag, that's somehow better, but that's somehow going to change the, the picture. Um, Oh, but overpopulation is, is a major one. People, a lot of people seem convinced that they should have fewer children and that will fix overpopulation. 
kind of ignoring the fact that a lot of countries in the world are in fact underpopulated going through demographic collapse, while other countries that are overpopulating tend to go through um, a cycle of die-off and have done so repeatedly over the centuries and will probably do so again. So there is no global problem of overpopulation at all if you look at it that way. Um, but in any case, nobody is responsible for it that I can, that I can spot. Nobody has the, the skills needed to fix the problem. Um, nobody should be entrusted with that task and nobody is in control of the situation to a sufficient extent. So that is a really misplaced um, type of feeling of responsibility, if you will. It's not actual responsibility, it's feelings thereof. Uh, but in terms of what is real responsibility, well, it's instinctual. We tend to take responsibility for, first and foremost for those closest to us, for our children, for our parents, for our families, for our neighbors, you know, our, our, our little group of people, of humans. We take responsibility for the animals around us. If, if we want to be humane. That, those are the normal types of responsibility. And then the, the circle of responsibility can expand in various ways given the right circumstances. But that's not, a, that's not something that's done willy-nilly. That is really part of a, a wider social contract that, that, has, that is difficult to achieve and difficult to sustain. Yeah, totally. So can you kind of wrap this conversation up into a series of, of directives and solutions. Uh, I mean, given the, the state of, um, maybe, maybe let's just, given the most recent political history in the last couple of years, you know, where is the Western world now? Where is it going? Um, you know, as an update to your book on this interview right now in, in a soundbite. Um, and, uh, and what, what can individuals do um, right outside their back door to help um, either stem the, uh, help to create change with, on a societal level, if they can, if, if, they, if there are aspects that, that they can be held responsible for. Um, and if not, um, things that they can, they can do on an individual level that, um, that may increase their own anti-fragility in the, uh, should, should some sort of disruption or consequence um, strike the US or Canada or, or any of the Western worlds for that matter? Well, the disruptions are, are, uh, are here. You know, a, lot, a lot of people's lives have been disrupted and are being disrupted all the way. There are a lot of people graduating from college whose careers are just not, not launching at all because there aren't really a lot of opportunities for them. Or if they are, then they're likely to be chewed up and spat out pretty quickly the next round of layoffs or something like that. But basically you can tell how, far, how long uh, an animal will survive by the amount of subcutaneous fat they have before the winter comes. Well, people who don't have subcutaneous fat will probably not survive you know, the, the, the collapse winter that is quite likely to come. Um, and, and the way you fight it, what the equivalent of subcutaneous fat for us is not money in the bank necessarily because that can lose its value pretty quickly, but relationships with other people and skills and actual access to resources and knowing, knowing how to make use of them. Um, you know, basically being resourceful to the people around you and knowing how to fi find people who will be resourceful back. You know, th those are the things that people should, should, uh, um, should focus on. Um, any kind of a monoculture including a human monoculture where everybody works for one organization. Uh, and if that organization fails, then the entire town is suddenly destitute. Those situations are to be av avoided at all costs. But basically it's, um, uh, I think what, what people should consider doing is maybe lower their st standard of living artificially for, for the time being, but, but try to build up that buffer of, of resources and skills and connections and, and whatever else they, they think of, uh, so that when the rug is pulled out from under them, as happens to so many people all the time, uh, they will be able to land on their feet. Yeah, the Stoics um, lived by a philosophy of that, where they would go long periods of time uh, without uh, living at a much lower uh, quality of life or uh, less money or less riches or less opulence 
um, so, so such that if it ever was uh, that they lost their, um, their their riches, essentially, that they would be able to land on their feet, essentially. So something similar. It's amazing how that that idea is still relevant today. I think it is. Yes, I think that's something that people should really focus on. Even for, for some families, like a starting point might be just like go go camping, go tent camping. Um, right. Discover how, discover what that's like and build it build it up from there. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Do you have any closing thoughts that you want to share with folks, Dimitri, before we uh, open it up for questions? Um, well, just one thing I wanted to to notice that I. I uh, I just put out a book of essays called Collapse and the Good Life. I used to put out a book of essays once a year. Now it's like almost twice a year. This is the second book I put out this year. Um, and I'm slowly shifting focus towards basically making the best of whatever happens as opposed to predicting a dire future. Um, so I hope people pick up a, a copy from Amazon. Um, it's available all over the world now. Fantastic. Cool. So uh, folks, we're going to shift the conversation now um, and we're going to get ready to um, open it up to questions for you guys. So if you have specific questions for Dimitri, please put them up into the chat window right now. Um, we're going to go over to uh, Sarah here shortly and she's going to announce the winner of the book for today. Um, if you want to be on our list and get a 25% discount code for Dimitri's book in the next 48 hours, you can find the information for that in the show notes below. Um, if you found this useful and um, you're potentially going to share it with somebody or, um, or, or just the information, you, you got a lot of value out of it, hit, give us a like uh, down there that helps the channel to track. Um, and uh, yeah, please share it on social media. It always helps the, the video to track itself. And I would just remind you, please put up your questions for Dimitri right now. I'd be curious to know uh, what's going through your heads right now as a result of um, this conversation. And uh, we'll get to those questions in a second. So stop, start stockpiling them right now. Sarah, did you want to announce the winner for the book? Uh, um, yes, I do. <laughs> Sorry, I've been so caught up with um, everybody's comments. It's been really um, fun to be a part of it all. And we've had lots of people commenting. Um, I would like to uh, choose um, Teresa Munson. Perfect. Okay, so now, I, do, I do have to say, I'm not sure if they're overseas or not. If so, we would be providing the ebook. Right. So if you're in the Canada, the United States, uh, New Society will ship you a book. And if you're overseas, um, you'll be getting an ebook. Perfect. So if you can uh, send me an email and I'll put my email into the comment section down below, um, then we will um, get all your details. So we'll need your address, um, Teresa, and uh, we will make sure that we get that book shipped out to you either electronically or physically. And um, we will open it up to questions right now. If you guys are interested in purchasing Dimitri's book, again, uh, sign up for our newsletter list down below and we'll send you a coupon code after the show. Um, you'll also be notified about uh, future uh, interviews that we're going to do. And the next interview that we're doing actually is um, uh, Richard Heinberg. Um, so we're going to be talking about the end of growth, uh, one of the next books. Um, that should be a really interesting conversation. And I don't think I'm done with Dimitri yet. I'd like to uh, have a couple more interviews with him. So we'll we'll cue that up and make sure that you guys are are notified uh, when the next one uh, uh, occurs. So there's my uh, my email address right there. Um, so Teresa, please send all your details there, your address, um, with regards to where we're sending that book, and we'll take care of it from there. So let's uh, start looking at some of these questions here. We're starting to get a few questions coming in. So Christopher Kinney says, which countries would be most ideal to live in when the global system collapses, Dimitri? Well, I don't have a list of countries, but there's a reason why I moved back to Russia other than the fact that I'm from here, uh, which is that is a, it, it, it's turning out to be a remarkably uh, stable and well provided for place. Uh, energy is pretty important for any developed country. Russia is a developed economy. 
And it turns out that Russia has the mother load of uh, energy resources. Um, you know, remarkably, uh, most of the world is discovering less than one unit of energy per, per, for every four units of energy that are, that are exhausted, burnt up. But Russia is, it turns out, is continuing to add to, to its uh, pile of resources. Uh, just started exploring in new areas where you know it's a little bit warmer now and a little bit easy, easier and more accessible. So Russia is going to be the energy provider of last resort to a lot of countries around the world, uh, especially those that happen to be friendly and nice to Russia. Um, Americans take note. Um, <laughs> and and uh, there, there are a lot of other countries around the world that I've visited that I, I think would do well. I, you know, I think Costa Rica will do fine, you know, and Panama. Those Central American countries um, will probably do fine. I haven't been to Mongolia, but I, I have friends who've gone. And, you know, it's, it's a bunch of uh, Soviet era high rise uh, apartment buildings in Ulaanbaatar that are surrounded by a sea of yurts. So if, if things turn dire in, in Mongolia, there'll be more yurts and the place basically runs on grass anyway. So I think they'll do fine. They, they've been around for a few thousand years. They'll be around for a few thousand more. So those are the sorts of things that I would ex expect. Those, those are the sorts of situations that I would um, expect, expect to persist without too much disruption. I think a lot of major cities will become unsurvivable in very short order around the world. Uh, especially ones that are very recent, um, basically absorbing lots of people from the countryside very suddenly. Um, those are very susceptible to major disruption. It's really interesting that you brought up energy returned on energy invested. So I'm, I'm formerly a petroleum engineer and um, I've had some really interesting conversations with two uh, oil and gas CEOs recently, um, both of which were engineers. and. Um, they were great conversations because uh, I basically, in my line of work, I, I design resilient homes, acreages, and farms. And so we end up getting a lot of um, professionals hiring us to, to build resilient infrastructure for them um, in all of the aspects, food, energy, shelter, water, waste. Um, and uh, I, I tend to attract a lot of geologists actually uh, to my consulting practice. And I, some of the geologists are very aware of this um, problem around energy return on energy invested, and they can speak quite fluently about it. Um, but the CEOs that I ended up interviewing recently um, had never really given it much thought. Um, and so the other con the conversation is either, yeah, energy return on energy invested. And for those of you who don't know what that means, is if back prior to 1940 in Saudi Arabia, um, you know, they were getting about 100 out, 100 barrels of oil out for one barrel in. Um, and uh, after 1970, we were kind of averaging globally, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Dimitri, but 40 out for one in. Um, and some of the recent stuff that I've read talks a little bit about how shale oil and gas is, you know, as little as six to one. You, you mentioned four to one. Um, some of the stuff I've read from Chris Martinson claims the oil sands is, is 11 units out for, for 10 units in, and that doesn't include any reclamation. Um, and so when I left the oil and gas industry, we were about 86 million barrels a day globally. We're, I think, close to 94 million. I'm curious to know um, how much of that increase from 86 to 94 do you think is cannibalism in terms of the energy industry cannibalizing itself in order to um, uh, continue to operate? And, and just a little factoid for folks, I was talking to a, a buddy of mine who's still in the oil and gas industry um, who, who does all their fracking in North America. And he was saying that one uh, well pad to frack uh, can take upwards of 400,000 liters of diesel fuel in less than eight days just to run the pumps. Um, just to kind of give you a, a scale um, in terms of the amount of energy that goes into um, opening up some of these tight shales uh, for, for oil and gas. So how much of the, um, of the oil, the increase in production um, is due to cannibalism, and how quickly do you see this energy return on energy invested catching up to us? Well, I, actually, I've been looking at, at uh, the, these uh, 
EROI calculations uh, recently, and it turns out that the whole thing is basically everybody's poor cousin. Nobody wants to handle it. So the petroleum engineers have a very kind of uh, blinkered uh, petroleum engineering view of it. So they, they don't consider a lot of things that are external to them, such as the beer they drink, where that comes from. Is that part of the cost of producing energy or isn't it? Mm. Uh, that's ignored. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of other costs are ignored just like that. But if you include them all, then uh, it, it's just unclear what you do with those numbers. It, it, um, so one approach that seems to be a little bit more promising is money in versus money out. Um, it's not perfect, but it does tell you a few different things that are very interesting. For instance, the whole uh, tar sands patch in, in Canada right now is losing billions, absolutely going broke. It's, it's just not making any profits at all. So that tells you that maybe that endeavor is, uh, you know, not, not long for this world and, and not a good idea anyway. Um, another thing is if you can look at, you can look at the economics of the fracking, the whole fracking industry in the US and, um, and see that it never made it any profit. The only reason it continues to run is by taking on more and more debt all the time. And the only reason it could take on all that debt is because of uh, very low interest rates, artificially low interest rates. If interest rates were at their historical levels, there would be no fracking industry in the United States at all. Um, and then you can look at what other people are um, around the world are doing. So the Russians, for instance, are you know, drilling for oil and producing oil and setting records once in a while and how much oil they, they produce and export. Well, they, they're sitting on a gigantic uh, amount of uh, shale oil. Like the, the, the size of the shale oil patch in Russia is roughly the size of the continental United States. It's called Bajana the Svita. It's, um, it's in Western Siberia somewhere, uh, which is huge. Well, they tried producing some oil from there just to say they did. And, and uh, that's about it. Uh, they're just not very interested in it because, you know, it's cheaper to dri drill in, in shallow Arctic water than it is to produce shale oil. And they, they, they know that they've learned their lesson. Um, so if, if you look at the economics of it, and if you look at all of the people who are in the oil industry, who are losing money, like all of Saudi Arabia put together is losing money. Like the entire fracking patch, shale patch in the US is losing money, that like Canadian tar sands. That tells you more than just some kind of like how many units of energy in versus how many units of energy out. I mean, yes, it's, it's a useful calculation to just knock various things completely out. Like, you know, like uh, corn-based ethanol. It's just a ridiculous idea. Um, so you can do, it, it just doesn't pencil out on, in terms of the energy that's invested in. For various other things, it's better to look at economics. Great, thanks for that. Um, Teresa asks the question, Dimitri, do you have any good links for supporting mental health in these difficult times? No, I don't, I'm sorry. I, um, I, I really, well, I have some tips though. Um, stay away from psychiatrists as much as possible. Um, they get you on various things that are worse. The, the cure is worse than the disease in a lot of cases. Hmm. Plus most of the, what they prescribe doesn't even work. Interesting. Um, William asks, Dimitri, can you speak to the role of Dasha as in the, the resilience of the Russian people? And I'm, I'm really curious of that too. Oh, well, it's, um, it, it, it is always important in bad times. Um, you know, when there's no food in the stores, the Russians just leave the city in droves during the summer. You know, the, 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 the growing season is short, but, but rather effective because of uh, the amount of sunlight. You have something like, you know, close to, uh, you know, 20 hours of sunlight in the middle of the summer that far north. And, and so they grow a lot of fat, a lot of stuff fast. And it, it, it really helps people survive the hard times. During the good times, that, that's more of just a place for rest and recreation, swimming in the river and you know, grilling and, and, and um, 
festive occasions. But most Russians have still still have a place in the country. They have an apartment in the city and a place in the country. That is that is the usual setup. Yeah, I think it's a really brilliant system. Uh, Taleb would call that barbelled uh, because it benefits you in the good times and it benefits you in the bad times. Um, yeah. And it really wouldn't be that that hard to set up. It would just be a you know a policy policy shift. I mean, you look at a country like Canada. We've got uh, you know 30, 35 million people in this country and so much land. Um, <laughs> you know, just creating that kind of a culture, if it was possible to create that kind of culture, right? I think that there's a, a large percentage of our population that, again, they get enamored by the shiny labels at Costco and the apparent abundance there um, without really realizing the state of the, the water supply in California or um, you know, any of the other issues that we could talk about uh, in, this, um, in this, this show here. So there's um, another question here. Do you think Western society can recover? And if so, what do you think it would take? Well, I don't... I don't think it can recover in, the, in its current state. It'll, it'll try to probably stage a few different types of very localized revivals. You know, it might go through uh, periods of better times. But I think overall, the best choice is uh, kind of to, to abandon the, the, the patterns that have been in place for a really long time, which are basically colonialist patterns, if you think about it. And I think the best option for a lot of people in many places around the world that are of the Western mindset is to quote unquote, go native. So one, one example that I have is um, uh, people go all over the place and no matter where they go, it could be in the, in the tundra, it could be in the, in the tropics. Uh, if they're of the, let's say English persuasion, they tend to build stick built houses, balloon frame, clapboard, that sort of thing. And the natives look at that in shock and think, well, that's completely ridiculous because here we move around a lot because we have to. And so we, we build yurts and over here, it's really hot. So we build a, out of Adobe and, you know, somewhere else um, it has to be on stilts because otherwise it'll just rot away instantly because we're in the middle of the jungle. But, but no, the settlement pattern that you see is just this typical settlement pattern of you know, platted land with stick build buildings on it. I think that pattern is just not going to hold up. So, um, you know, what, how, what, how important is nomadicism? Is it, is it something that like, is that the ultimate form of anti-fragility or is it, you know, does bioregionality trump that, uh, that concept? So when you say go native, are you saying, well, look at the local patterns and how indigenous people have thrived in that bioregion in the past, or is there an inherent um, resilience or anti-fragility um, by being mobile? Well, a lot of people are nomads, even though they don't think of themselves as nomads. They've just been, been forced into that situation uh, and, and have learned to take advantage of it and enjoy it. Um, there, there's any number of software engineers just basically taking it easy on the beaches of Goa in India or, or Bali or someplace like that, uh, or Paris. Anywhere there's a Wi-Fi wi wi hotspot, you can, do some, you can do some work these days. With a lot of people, you don't even know where in the world they are because they connect remotely. There, there are all these digital nomads all over the, in the world, but that mimics earlier years because nomadism requires much higher grade skills and technology. It has to be portable and it has to be useful in all sorts of different situations instead of just one. It also takes a much higher level of discipline and organization because you can't just have junk lying around. You, you, you have to figure out how few tools you can have in your toolbox and still get the job done. So if you look at nomadic tribes, those were the really transformative tribes throughout the history of mankind. If, if you look at the entire Middle East, for instance, the Arabs are people of the tent. The Jews were the people of the tent as well. Um, when they talk about the house of God, they talk about the tent of God. That's the same word, bet or bait. Um, so nomadism is really important. Um, and uh, for very unsettled times, where it's limb pickings just about everywhere, 
being on the move provides a solution to find whatever you need somewhere, not necessarily where you want to be, but somewhere you just pass through. Hmm. So I want to bring up a story that uh, that I read in your book there. Um, you were talking about getting pulled out of the water um, at, a, at a shipyard um, and recognizing the dilapidated nature of the shipyard and that they had clearly come through some tough economic times and um, that they basically had stores of wealth that they didn't even recognize in the lead that were, were in the keels of these sailboats. Um, I want to have a, a little bit of a conversation around you know, money and finance and, and uh, maybe we can build in again, kind of thinking about your latest book on technology, um, how Bitcoin is eating the world and, and where you think there are opportunities uh, to basically create enduring wealth, um, you know, in light of the unsustainability of our current financial system. And, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. I, I know you'll know where to take it from there. Well, the thing that surprises me about Bitcoin is how few people realize how incredibly stupid it is. I mean, I, I could outline you a couple of ways in which it is incredibly stupid. First of all, to, to have basically to be able to, to uh, autonomously use Bitcoin without going through some uh, untrustworthy business that handles Bitcoin for you, you, have, you basically have to have uh, an archive of all of the Bitcoin transactions on your hard drive, which is like, I don't know, 40 gigs, something like that, but it's growing all the time. You have to basically have the entire history of Bitcoin on your hard drive, um, which is kind of unwieldy and incredibly stupid if you think about it. So if like to spend a penny, you have to have the entire history of pennies, of their use, where they went, who traded what penny with whom, on your hard drive, like in, in your archives, that's incredibly stupid. <laughs> and then any transaction involving Bitcoin has to be repeated by everyone because they don't trust each other. So basically every transaction uh, involving two people involves the entire Bitcoin realm, just wastes an incredible amount of energy. Then of course, if you publish your digital wallet, your Bitcoin wallet, then every transaction you've ever engaged in with anyone is in the public domain because they have that information on their hard drive. So they can figure out who, who you exchanged Bitcoins with. And, and it's, it makes it very easy to track people. You basically, if you, want, if you want your credit card report posted on the internet, use Bitcoin. <laughs> if you want your credit card statement on the internet, use Bitcoin. And, and then just the entire energy cost of it is just absolutely ridiculous. So it's, it's the most boneheaded idea in the world. It's a complete swindle. You know, it's, it's basically just, it's ridiculous from every angle and yet people bought into it. I think it's just going to completely crash. You know, people say, well, Bitcoin is kind of stupid, but then blockchain is so intelligent. But blockchain is the idea of having every penny ever accounted for on your hard drive. On, on, every, on the hard drive of every person who ever wants to spend a penny or earn a penny. I mean, that, that is dumb. So blockchain is dumb too. All of it is dumb. Super interesting. So what are the, what are the enduring, the, the forms of enduring wealth that, that people should engage um, with, with this conversation in mind with the five stages of collapse? Um, how, do you look well, at, there, how do you look at wealth? There are two forms of wealth. One is uh, direct access to resources and knowledge on how to use them. So a potato field and knowing how to grow potatoes is wealth of, a, of the most basic sort. Uh, knowing how to go out, go out into the forest and procure meat is wealth and, and having the equipment and the skills to do it. And the other form of wealth is trust between people. Mm. Now, it, it can mean actual stores of symbolic wealth, you know, cowrie shells or gold bullion or uh, artworks, you know, antiques, whatever it is that people use as a store of value, as a sort of accounting system between them. But ultimately, it's all a way to account for trust. There are placeholders for trust between people. And, and so trust is the really, really precious commodity. And the problem is that if people want to trade over distances with people they don't know, 
then they have to have governments and they have to have government chartered licensed institutions in the loop. And question is, can you trust them? Hmm. Um, you know, can, can you actually, uh, or, or is it just sort of one of those things that, well, I don't trust them, but I don't have any choice. So eventually I'll get wiped out. Well, that's not wealth. Right. Yeah. I thought your point in your book on gold was really, really valid as well in, in how, um, well, there were several, several points in there. I'd heard it. I've never uh, actually had the specific date, but the, the way that um, gold started to undermine the, the currency of the United States and how they, I'd heard it and I didn't realize that they had actually put politicians or, or uh, sorry, not politicians, but um, enforcers essentially into all of the banks so that if you were to go and withdraw your gold currency from the bank, that they would just confiscate that from you. Um, and, you know, it's crazy how often we see these guys coming up on YouTube, these hotshot financiers talking about how gold and silver will be the, the be all and the end all. Um, and it's the only way that you should, um, one of the, the main ways that you should use to store wealth and to transition or bridge it between today and tomorrow or today and, and that crisis. Um, maybe you can just fill folks in on, on some of your philosophies around precious metals. Well, I think that if, if you expect to be able to uh, heat your house and, and put food on the table using precious metals, that's kind of the wrong approach. If, if on the other hand, you need to, uh, in an emergency, book passage on a ship to another part of the world or grab a bunch of farmland to farm once you get there, then, then having some amount of gold or silver, although silver is a bit bulky, um, is a really good idea because it's recognized throughout the world. It doesn't really, uh, it, it doesn't lose its value if it's melted down. So it doesn't, it's completely anonymous. You can't really track it, track where it came from. Uh, it can be in the form of an ingot and still be valuable. So it's a good solution. It's, it's a portable emergency store of, of value that is recognized throughout the world. Um, in terms of going to the market to buy cheese, no, you don't want to pay for cheese with gold bullion. I don't think that'll ever happen. I don't think that it's go there's going to be a financial system based on fractional gold bullion or anything like that either, because there, there just isn't enough gold in the world to make a, a viable economic system. It, it'll still have to be based on, on some other form of, of valuable commodity. Um, oil is actually a pretty good basis as the Chinese are discovering. Hmm. So they have petro yuan contracts backed with gold. That seems to be working pretty well. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of movement in that direction. Um, a little bit of gold as a backup. Um, a lot of central banks have started buying up gold. Um, and then you have the situation with the US and and the UK especially, who seem to have sold their gold secretly to the Chinese without telling anyone. So nobody really knows how much gold they have left. But at some point, it'll, we'll find out, you know, when the water comes out of the pool, as the saying goes, you know, we find out who's been swimming naked. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know it's late over there, Dimitri. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight um, on this, this conversation. Thanks to all the, the people out there watching um, that asked all those great questions. Um, Sarah, did you have any closing thoughts before we stop the uh, conversation today? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank everybody that was commenting online. It was really interesting to see the conversation and um, again, it's a way to uh, cultivate community and realize that we all have a lot of the same concerns and we just don't speak out about it because sometimes it seems too overwhelming. But once you start talking about it and realizing that there are solutions, um, I think it makes it a little easier for everybody. So thanks very much for your time to meet Dimitri and Rob as well. Thank you. It's been fun. Yeah. Did you have any closing thoughts, Dimitri, before we sign off? No. Well, we've, we've gone on long enough, but I look forward to doing it again. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody on YouTube. If you uh, found that useful, please give it a like. Uh, please share on your social media channels if you think that this information is something that other people should know about. And uh, we'll be back in two weeks with Richard Heinberg. Uh, keep an eye on the YouTube channel. There's lots more content coming up in the next little while. 
And uh, yeah, just really appreciated uh, your time, Dimitri and Sarah. And we'll see you guys all in the next show.